Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. In this sixth video, we're really going to be focused on preparing your project now for export and getting it packaged into your articles and into your overall way of distributing the story you're going to tell to your audience. Let's get started. So up until this point, we've really been focused on creating the content, uh, getting the pieces that you, you know, you've thought of that you need downloaded, placed into a project, and making that composition within your 3D editing software. Now it's time to get it out of that software, get it hosted, and get it shared and distributed to all the people who you intend to actually see it and consume the story that you've created. But before we get to that, let's talk again about your homework from episode five, where you added more context to your scene. After you did that, well, you should have been showing it to more people. And did you find that those people were more able to guess what your story was about? Because you've added more context and they were able to connect the dots between what you were hoping that they'd take away from it and the composition you'd actually put in front of them. Up until now, you've likely been showing people your work by sharing with them your Blender scene, either showing them your computer or maybe screen sharing in order to show it to them. However, there's a big difference between the experience someone has looking at a scene when it's running flat on a monitor or in someone else's software compared to the experience they're going to have clicking on it in the actual platform you're hosting it on, and especially the difference between the flat 2D and the 3D XR that someone's going to be able to walk through in their smartphone. So we really need to get it into those platforms so that you can start testing how is it engaged with by users the way they're actually going to be engaging with it. So while we're only now going from Blender to XR, for future projects, you should be testing your XR from the very first skeleton that you've created. So you make that first box scene, you immediately try to get into AR to start to feel, is this going to be a good composition for yourself? Don't assume you know how it's going to feel until you're in the platform that you're actually going to be hosting on. So with that in mind, we're going to now start to prepare our Blender project for uh, export into a GLTF2 file format, because that's the file format we're going to be using when we go to host it on a platform. So a lot of these we're going to cover in this next section are actually from episode seven, because there are things you'll need to check that you debug before you export. Those will include applying modifiers, checking your shaders, and checking it for any animations that you might have that they're the right duration to fit in the timeline that you're actually exporting from Blender. We'll go over modifiers and shaders in the next video. Animations we're not going to be covering during this episode, but it's just to say that before you would export, generally you'd be looking for these things, or you'd be looking for errors that occur in your export and maybe trace them back to one of those steps. But if you have any more questions about how to work with GLTF exports from Blender, check out the guide that Blender has on the constraints of a GLTF export. With that said though, let's go ahead and put our Mars Rover exported out so that we can test it and see how it looks when it's outside of the Blender environment. So here we are back in our Mars Rover project, focusing on our story about where it landed because that's the first one we're trying to get published. And here we can see our scene is just as we left it from episode six. Some of the first things I'm looking for again, do we have any modifiers? You'll learn to identify that in the next video by identifying this blue wrench icon being placed next to the objects. I don't see any issues there. And because we haven't gone over shaders yet, we're not gonna show you where to look for that until the next video, but it's just to say that when we export this in a moment, if we're finding any colors seem broken, something we expected to be colored is now just white or has some other issue visualizing it, then we may need to trace that back to the shaders in the Blender project. Without seeing anything like any issues right off the bat, let's just go ahead and do our export. So we're gonna to navigate to File, Export, GLTF2, which includes the GLB format. Here in Blender, we will find the GLB format is the one that's pre-selected. And that will just mean that unlike when you downloaded from Sketchfab and you had a scene.gltf folder or file and you had a lot of other files that were downloaded and zipped together, this will place your entire export into a single file that you can move around and it contains everything needed to load your 3D scene. So we'll be using this GLB format then. And we're gonna just navigate our way to a folder designated for exports just to make your life easier to know 
what was my working files, what was my blender files, what were my export files. So here in my exports folder, we can call this our episode 5.2, uh, where it landed. And actually, sorry, we'll call this our episode 6, where it landed, and this will become a .glb. We'll go ahead and hit export. And now we'll navigate our way over to this folder where we can find our GLB has appeared with a size of 25 megabytes. Is that big? Is that small? We'll talk more about that in the next episode. But if you're working with a Windows computer, you may be able to open this file off the bat. If you're not working with a Windows computer, you probably don't have a default uh, opening software for this file format just by like, double clicking on it and seeing what it looks like. So for everyone, we actually recommend that they go to this website, gltfviewer.donmccurdy.com. And this website will be a place where you can just drag and drop the file that you've exported and see if it's working. So let's go ahead and do that now. And here we are. The website does add a little bit of lighting to help show uh, some 3D lighting in your space, even though you didn't export any lights. But we can see that our object appears to have exported correctly. And while there may be something minor wrong in here, I'm not seeing anything that majorly stands out to me. And that looks great. Also, don't be alarmed if you see in the bottom corner some lists of a number of warnings or a number of errors. This may occur, but if you're not seeing anything really starkly wrong with your project, it's likely for hosting on Sketchfab, you won't have any issues either. Um, and you can learn more about what these errors mean by clicking on them. It is a bit more advanced to learn how to debug your projects. But just to say, if you see a few, don't immediately think your project's not going to work. Take a look at what you're seeing on your screen and take that as gospel for the short time being. So with our 3D object looking good to us, then we're ready to start thinking about hosting it on Sketchfab. Now, Sketchfab, as we already talked about, does include a large store and an asset library that we can be using to download files, but also the place where lots of people upload their files. So this is really useful because you can upload your stuff there and it does have an embeddable player that you can then use on your own website or on your articles so that you can create it, host it on Sketchfab, take that player and put it right into a module or into an article and let people click with it in 3D or click into AR mode if they're uh, visiting that module from a mobile device. The other some other advantage of Sketchfab, it will support most animations that you put into it. It allows you to upload an audio track in there as well. And it supports what are called annotations where you can designate certain points around the 3D model and type out some additional text specific to that particular location on the model. It supports fairly large file sizes for most websites or for most 3D platforms. Um, a free user, which I suggest that you become now because uh, you're using this as your educational period, um, will support an upload of up to 100 megabytes. Uh, but if you are a company, you'll be looking to use a, a premium or enterprise plan, which will support a larger file size and it will allow a lot more people to be opening and engaging with the traffic that you're generating, getting more data from that information, as well as potentially white labeling if you really want to brand it with your company brand um, or your newsroom or media company and so forth. So let's go over to the Sketchfab now. We can kind of see that here are the various plans you can pick from. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm just gonna be working with a basic free plan at just, a, just like you might. Um, and let's go through the process of uploading our object to Sketchfab. So, on my with my, my uh, account logged in, I just come to the upload button. I click upload and it gives me the prompt to just drag and drop a file here as well. They support a lot of different file formats, not just the GLTF or GLB. However, again, it does mean that you're working with just a single file, which is great for beginners. We're going to bring this GLB in. We can see it says Mars Rover scene episode six where it landed. I can start the upload while that's uploading. This is where you need to remember to give credit to the people who you took your assets from. Um, in this case, we were working with uh, Creative Commons Zero uh, public domain assets, but that's not always gonna be the case. So you remember that the cost of using Creative Commons is to give them attribution. For myself right now, we're just gonna say, this was produced by Henry Kaiser. Uh, we have models by NASA JPL. Uh, via Thomas Lynn 
at Sketchfab, and we have photos by NASA JPL. If we were giving, again, Creative Commons attribution, because we were not working with CC zeros, we would be saying specifically, this work includes assets by that person and you know their username or their actual name and a link ideally to their page by Sketchfab licensed under CC by 4.0. If you're working with royalty free assets from the Sketchfab store, the Turbo Squid store, the CG Trader store, or any of the other ones out there, in those cases, you may or may not be required to uh, cite them. You should read the terms of the license based on what you purchased. Also, if you buy royalty free, give people credit. There's no bad karma that can come your way because you shared where you got your, your various pieces from. So now we just need to wait for an extra minute or two while this object finishes processing. And once that's finished processing, we'll show you how to edit the 3D layout of what you've uploaded inside Sketchfab's engine before you go ahead and hit publish. So now that it's finished processing, we're gonna go ahead and press this edit button. It only took about 30 seconds to process, which was really great. Um, by clicking the edit 3D settings, I can go ahead and say, you know, confirm you wanna leave. Before I confirm I wanna leave, maybe I can just hit save. So it saves the changes I've already typed in. Now we can hit edit 3D settings. So here we are in uh, Sketchfab's editor. Um, here in the editor, we can see just again, a view of the 3D model. We can rotate the model if we need to. We can change how the lighting on the model is calculated. We can change any background images, either a color that we want to put behind the model, an image that we want to put behind the model as a Sketchfab default, uh, a environment that we may want to put behind the model. And if you have, so here we can see some default environments that you can work with from Sketchfab. Uh, that you can either blur or you can uh, leave as they are. But also, if you're using then one of the upgraded plans, you can uh, upload custom uh, 360 images slash HDR images into Sketchfab to give a custom background environment to your scene. I, like, I think this one looks really good for our Mars scene. Beyond this, we can also then just check on uh, the various materials that are running to make sure everything's running correctly. We can add post-processing, as we talked about when you're hosting, you can add a bit more depth of field or some added sharpness, various special effects that you can add to your upload. If you want to add annotations for something specific happening in the scene, you can now click on a certain area and type something specific about what's happening in that area of the project. Um, we're not going to be using annotations for this particular project, so we'll just delete this one back out that we just created to show you. If you have any animations, you can check on the animations and how they're working. When working with AR and VR, this is an important moment to set the scale and the position of the person that you're going to be uh, expecting, like how you expect them to engage with your scene. So for example, right now, my person is a lot larger than the rover actually is in real life. So instead of having the person be larger, I want them to be roughly the real scale of the object. So we're going to make them a little bit smaller to about, let's say, there. Um, in reality, these tires come up to someone's knee about, and so this looks fairly close. If I want them to be right in front of the rover, I could do that, or I could also move them to the side and rotate them to look at the rover from a different starting perspective. I think that's gonna look pretty good, because then they'll be able to read the title as well, and they'll still be standing fairly close to the model, uh, so they only have to take a step or two to start exploring the scene. After we've got all that set up, if you have any sound files that you're uploading, this is where you'll click and add your sound files. And then those sound files will be uh, playing when you, someone's looking at your 3D scene as it loads. One of the last things you're definitely going to want to do before you uh, publish your piece and save your settings is think about what is the starting perspective you want someone to have when they're not just looking at it in XR, but they're looking at it in the 3D embed that you're going to place into a web page. In order to set that perspective, here in the Sketchfab viewport, you're going to go ahead and kind of zoom. You might use your uh, middle mouse button to strafe left and right, or you can use your left click to go ahead and rotate your perspective. And you want to figure out what is the right composition to start your user in. So for me, maybe I think right about here is a nice perspective. And then when I, I can practice rotating by left clicking and seeing where am I going to rotate around? 
So maybe I don't want to rotate around the edge of the rover. I'd like to rotate more around the middle of the rover. So I'll just move it a little over a little bit more. And now when I practice rotating, I'm rotating more around maybe this point of the rover seemingly. Once I've got that starting perspective dialed in and I filled up the viewport with what I want people to see in the embed, often remember your embed in your article page is likely going to be a lot smaller than this full screen view that you're starting with right now. So think, how is this going to look when it's only a fraction of this size on the page? But once you've got your shot dialed in, you're just going to come to this top left corner and you're going to click Save View. This then will create the thumbnail image that will preload as your entire embed is actually loading in the background, just open. But it also then will go ahead and set what perspective should this embed have as it loads up in your project. And then this will be the first glance people see. So remember, it's not just about filling all of their needs in this first glance, but hopefully once they've seen this perspective, they have a better understanding of what they want to go explore from there. And so you've not hidden necessarily things that they need to see on first glance, but you don't necessarily have to show them everything they might want to look at in the first glance. With all that done, I can save my settings again. And then before we hit publish, let's go and check one last time and say, oh, this title, while it was what we called as a working file, Mars Rover Scene Episode 6, where it landed, this is unlikely maybe what you want to title it uh, when you're preparing to publish it. So let's call this our Perseverance Rover where it, where it landed. So that we're really clearly establishing some of the nudge of what is this composition about. Um, if you have more categories, because you want to make sure that this is searchable on Sketchfab, you can add your categories. Um, also, you can add some tags as well to try to go ahead and improve the SEO around this if Sketchfab is somewhere that you really want to attract an audience. But if you're intending to just embed this into an article page, it may, this may be a bit unnecessary for you if you're really trying to make sure that the attention of this piece is focused to your own website. With that all done, I can go ahead and hit Save and Publish. As you can see, it's already finished. When you are working with a free account, you get 10 publishes per month that do not need to be store uploads or Creative Commons. Or if you're intending to upload your work as Creative Commons or sell it in the store, you can upload more assets than that per month. With that done, I have, of course, my link to copy and share on social or in other places just as a dedicated destination. Or I can go to my model page, and once I'm on my model page, here I can also find my embed code. This code is what we'll be using to copy and paste into the various websites that we're going to be publishing our piece on. This may be a WordPress or your own company's CRM. Um, but from here, you can see this is what we'll be copying, and there are some variables we can change still. What is the size of your embed that you want to be on the page as it loads? Do you want to show captions in the embed? Um, do you want to use a light or dark theme? Most commonly people use light themes on their websites, but this depends on the design potentially of your website. Uh, if you're working with an upgraded account, do you want to show, uh, remove the various Sketchfab branding that's on the embed um, or display the model inspector or hide the model inspector on the embed? Also, do you want to uh, you know, auto start? so that as soon as your page loads, it also loads this embed. There's no play button. People are already able to interact with it in 3D right off the bat. I highly encourage people to use the auto start. Um, animated entrance means when it loads, it kind of zooms in the model, as opposed to turning that off where it just kind of loads and the model is right there ready to go without any animated entry. Turntable just means that your object will, start, will load rotating and will start rotating if it hasn't been interacted with in a few seconds. Uh, and preloading textures is something that uh, if you have lots and lots of textures in your piece, it will make sure that they're all loaded before the 3D model loads. Otherwise, if you know that there may be various textures that are out of sight from your first perspective, you can load the 3D scene and then it'll start loading in textures as they enter the user's line of sight as they navigate the space. And other control options are really unlocked as you start to uh, upgrade your account. Um, as well as your annotations are things that, you know, do you want to show them on your embed or do you only want to show your annotations when you're on the Sketchfab page? Entirely up to you. Once that's all done, you're going to copy the clipboard, bring this over to the hosting site of your choosing, and you'll be able to run it from there. 
Now, Yahoo doesn't actually use Sketchup as a publishing platform. We have our own that we've built in, internally uh, called Yahoo Immersive. But uh, so, so in, in that case, we're not going to be showing you the steps of copying and pasting it into an embed code on your site. That is something that's fairly quick for you to set up. It will be completely unique to each of your various websites. But let's go ahead and assume that we have that now on our page. It's ready to publish. Uh, and let's check back in with Laura to find out her feedback about how we package this going forward. All right, Laura, so here is the versions we're looking at putting out tomorrow. Um, we got the one which has got the your billboard text card to talk about the, the creator position. Um, and then we got the one that will probably go to the day after, which has um, our cutout and our audio. Um, so what, what do we do from here? How do we get this out the door? I mean, the most important thing is like, you can build the most beautiful immersive project people got to find it and look at it, right? So really it's how do we package this up, make sure it gets the love that it deserves across our network and anywhere else on social, all these other places, make sure it has a great headline. So let's let's talk through, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do first? Uh, well, we, we already definitely know that we're, uh, the, the article writer is actually putting some nudges into the first, the lead paragraph to kind of uh, talk about, you know, check this out in the embed below. Um, so that should really hopefully, if, if someone landed on the article not knowing that there was an XR there, so now they didn't really figure that out, um, they're maybe reading in and being primed to do some of that activity in a second. Um, I thought maybe like we could put it in the headline. Like, do you have any idea like what maybe the headline should say if we're talking about you know tomorrow, Mars rover lands on or you know Perseverance rover lands on Mars? What we might say is that it's clear that there's something interactive in there. Yeah, I'm always like on the fence about whether to say like see it in XR or AR or 3D and like what are the words that people are going to respond to in a headline? And we've done a lot of kind of testing around that. Um, I think see it in your space is also something that works sometimes. Um, so I would kind of play around with character count and what's most important about the story, because it's really about the story, right? And so I think if this is a piece that's going directly with the landing, it should be more focused on that. And then maybe adding in a, you know, um, see the landing in 3D or, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's one way to do it. Um, I think if it's more about like the follow-up story and we're hearing from the scientist, it's really like have a NASA scientist in your space or, you know, um, I don't know, something like that. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we'll do like check out the Mars rover that landed today in your own space. And we don't necessarily have to say 3D or XR. Maybe we can just use those terms in the bodies so, of like SEO catch, catches it. I like to say 3D or in your space more than XR or AR, because I think those terms can kind of be alienating. People don't really know what it is. They think they have to download something additional. Sometimes we're not like quite there yet. And on the flip side, I think part of our job working in this space is to educate the audience about what these tools are and how storytelling is changing with them. So you got to kind of ease them in. That makes sense. Okay, so we'll have that in the, we'll have something like that in the headline, and then uh, we're gonna have it positioned pretty high up in the article, just because uh, we're thinking top four paragraphs somewhere. We're not quite sure where it's gonna go. We gotta find like the right place to break what the writer has written. Does that seem to work? Most importantly, is above the fold or above any jumps that you have, above any big ads on your page. Um, you know, making sure that it, it's front and center and that it loads quickly. I mean, I know we talked a lot about file size and you know, how we position these things within the actual content that we're making, but making sure that it loads quickly on the page is all part of that too, so that you're not waiting around for this 3D object to appear, that it's pretty seamless as you're scrolling down. That makes sense. I'll make sure we have autoplay turned on in the sketch we have embed then. Um, other than that, like, what do we need for social? If we're going to try to pull some people from social, what do you think we should be putting on there? Yeah, we'll definitely show them the project that we have now, like as soon as you can, because I think the more they understand about the content that's coming and they know about like the life cycle of this story and when people are talking about it on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else. So they can really help position um, different pieces of this story in a unique way for social. So definitely get them involved in the conversation. Um, I think one of the really cool things about uh, Web AR is building in this kind of I call it like 3D to 2D, but all that means is making a video out of your 3D project. 
That makes sense. Um, do you think we should like screen record or should we like actually render something out? I think screen record is usually all that you need. Um, I think talking to the social team would be really helpful because if there's a piece that's really unique and exciting and you want to build a separate Spark AR piece for Instagram, you know, that's something that, you know, you might want to consider doing. Um, might take a little more time, so it might be like a day two uh, piece of the project, but, you know, certainly could be worth it if you have the resources. That makes sense, yeah. We'll get a screen recording done in the next, like, 20 minutes and just send it over to them. And then, um, yeah, because I think a, a render would take us a lot longer, so maybe we'll render something for one later this week. Um, and we haven't done anything with Spark yet, so maybe we'll we'll learn more about that, um, and then we'll, we'll make a 3D model that we can actually have, like, live in our social account. Yeah, and I think you don't need to overthink it too much. Sometimes we just use a GIF and, you know, that's sufficient to link off to. Sometimes you're putting, you know, I think for something like this story, you want to see that rover crawling around your space, like, you know, you want to be able to see how it looks on your desk or, or maybe you're outside somewhere cool and you can put that 3D rover, um, you know, on on the ground and, and see what it really looks like. So I think taking a screen recording of the actual AR as opposed to just the desktop version for this story might be great. Some stories don't need that though. So, you know, kind of depends what you're working on. Cool, well, we'll get that done and then we'll, we'll go uh, let you know when it's, when it's published. Awesome, can't wait to see it. So from that meeting, we've got a couple things we can take away. First, we really want to prime our users to be prepared to interact with, a, with an XR embed in this article. Uh, we want to prime them both in the headline using verbs and nudges, and also then, of course, in the early paragraphs of the piece. Not necessarily in the lead, but quickly on so that they know there's something interactive coming and that it's kind of critical to their consumption of the entire holistic coverage. From there, we do want to embed the XR high up in the article, in the first few paragraphs, ideally. Um, if you're further down, one, it's unlikely more people are going to see it if they've scrolled that part of the page. Maybe they don't. Also, if it's near the bottom of the page, people really start expecting to see things they don't recognize and assuming they're ads. So you want to make sure if people are, you want people to engage with it, you get it high in the page. Then we also have to start thinking about all the other ways we might tease this out to people. One of the big ones is taking your 3D and making some 2D assets out of it. Generally, that involves creating a video. So we are going to you know, get a video created, maybe a screen share, which can be made really quickly. We'll talk about some other options in a minute. And then of course, you know, as we post to social, some social platforms actually support XR right now. And so is there a way that we can adapt what we've already produced so that it actually should be hosted on our social accounts in 3D for our audience that follows us there. So with that said, let's talk, you know, articles in a head or XR article headlines. Not everyone on your site is really expecting to see an interactive when they come to your page. They might be there just expecting to read something, but you can nudge them and prime them to get ready to do something more interactive based on the words that you use. So instead of starting out with a lot of jargon, you know, I had explained to you what XR was at the beginning of this series. Uh, maybe you want to say, do something in XR, they'd be like, what is XR? Instead, you can use really uh, common terms, some prepositions and some active verbs to prepare them to go beyond just reading and watching a video. You could say, you know, words like explore, check out, uh, place, uh, rotate, go inside. You can see more of them on the screen here, but there's a lot of options out there to kind of get them thinking about what I'm about to do actually involves me doing something with the story. And that can attract people and also helps uh, avoid uh, them being turned away by jargon they don't recognize. That said, you probably want to use some of those key terms, VR, AR, XR, 360, immersive, in some sort of copy to help improve your SEO. So with that done, you know, we can talk about for this piece, maybe we would say explore Perseverance Rover in your living room and see where it landed. That is a headline that sets up the story. It sets up some interactive elements. Um, and it doesn't have anything in there that's too jargony that it should be turning someone away. You'll have to, of course, you know, mix and match what terms you use in your own pieces going forward. But this is just an example headline we might use for this particular story. From there, again, we need to start thinking about what else we're going to use to show off this piece we produced. And that can involve going from 3D to 2D. So 
One of the easy ways we can do this is screen recording the upload. We've already made a Sketchfab while the Sketchfab piece is running in augmented reality on the Sketchfab mobile app. So that requires having that app downloaded. It also requires you kind of having some familiarity of using the screen recording features on either your iPhone or on your Android device. And so you would open up your 3D scene, you would go ahead and uh, launch the Sketchfab app, start your screen recording, and go ahead, just show yourself walking around the space and showing the object in all three dimensions. That can be really useful to show in a video at the top of the article on your social accounts to be able to prime people to understand, oh, I'm not necessarily just supposed to click and rotate this in the article. I really should consider launching it, seeing it, putting myself in the middle of the story. A more advanced thing you could do if you feel like screen recording uh, maybe isn't delivering the level of control you want uh, is to render out a whole animated video of the project within Blender itself. That is a bit more advanced. It does require you to bring back in lights and cameras to your Blender project. And it also likely requires you to learn how to animate a camera to move through your Blender project and look at a variety of kind of camera shots to help communicate in, in this video. So that's not just a static image, but is priming users to, again, rotate, move through, explore um, by the way that your camera is moving through, rotating and exploring around the subject of your 3D scene. That's more advanced than we're gonna be covering during this particular training program, but you can find some tutorials to how to render videos from Blender are linked below. Now, let's go to the big one, bringing your actual XR into the social platforms themselves. Now with Sketchfab, we were able to upload up to 100 megabytes for our upload. However, each platform has different constraints. So Spark AR, which is the platform for Facebook and Instagram, support up to 40 megabytes, in some cases a lot smaller. So already we're recognizing that the level of file size and the level of optimization we need in order to go from a Sketchfab maximum project to a Spark maximum project requires some finagling. Then if you're looking at Snapchat, Snapchat supports up to a maximum of four megabytes. And TikTok, while they have some AR right now, hasn't released a self-service platform yet. But we shouldn't necessarily expect it's going to be as large as Sketchfab. It will probably be somewhere between the file sizes of Snap and Spark. So with these much smaller file size requirements, we need to start thinking more about how do we reduce the file size of our project so that we can go ahead and put these 3D elements everywhere that our audience may want to explore with it. And we're going to cover optimization more in the next video. With that all said, your homework for this week is to really focus on uploading your 3D scene to Sketchfab. That means exporting that GLTF out of Blender, creating your Sketchfab account, uploading it on there, and then screen recording a video of your scene running in AR. Once you've done that, try to really put yourself in the AR and start to feel what is really just feeling different uh, compared to when you are working with it flat in your Blender scene. It is really common, as we mentioned at the start of this video, that the XR will feel very different than how you assumed it would feel when you were working with Blender. So now is the time that you need to start making tweaks again to go ahead and recompose your scene, moving the elements around so that they feel in XR the way that you want it to feel when it's just running in your, three, uh, your 3D players, um, be that the embed page or the uh, Blender screen. Once you have that done, you know, we would love to see what you've created. Go ahead and share some of your videos on social. Uh, if you hashtag Yahoo XR course, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll share some of our favorite stories that you guys are creating. Um, hey, this has been great. We'll see you in the very next video to talk about optimization, and I'll see you then.